Okay, that took a little adjusting. How's everybody doing? What's the ski tea? Okay, yeah, Shakti. Shakti. Okay, somebody tell me something or ask ask a question. If a train is moving... <laughs> you got to go ask those math guys. I just kicked him out. Chuck <laughs> Day. I don't think that was kidding. That was weird. You didn't specify what sort of question. Although, Kevin has a poem. I, I can't recite it verbatim. But the basic sort of operating... Uh, sort of thing in the poem is a census guy comes by, and I think it was her grandma, and he keeps asking, How old are you? And she says, Hechtetu, Hechtetu. So he writes down, 52. <laughs> 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 Well, H to two what would be zero. H to two is it's not counted. H to two it's not counted. <laughs> now we're gonna get to the do and the do two here in a second. Anybody else got a thought, observation, question? I was watching uh, Cream Pasty story. Uh, and he says, uh, and he says uh, I know other speakers uh, who say that as well, uh, as opposed to uh, I don't know why. And there's a couple, there are a number of phrases out there where, you know, because Clinkit is a, it's a language you can typically break down in all these different chunks. But there's a number of things that you can say that you just can't really break it down. And that's probably one of them. Gu'a means um, kind of to hope for something. Right? Yach means to be like something. Kwan is a way to sort of Soften a command and be more like may you, right? And so you'll hear things like that. So, iku ayach kun. You, but maybe that gua has something to do with, maybe it's actually a verb. It's, mm -hmm. Maybe it just sounds like gua. It's really hard to break down. Mm -hmm. uh, but it could be something where. It was part of this larger thing, and over time it gets pulled out. Another one is gunashchish. So that comes from a verb somehow, but it's really hard to figure out how. So the verb, like if you say chichish, because you see na. So those are two parts that pop up in prefix. Chichish. If you say chichish, that means it's possible, right? And if you say he thinks it's possible, right? And so you get this in the Raven stories. Like, he believes that he can fly into the wind. <laughs> and um, so probably the way to think about it is you're saying to somebody, you made it possible. That's kind of how it works. Uh, and so, and a lot of times people are look for just sort of straight translations, right? How do you say you're welcome? How do you say, you know, and so the, the languages don't work the same. So, uh, yeah, those are two that, and then for, and then if he says, du'a, it du'a yachwan. Well, now that certainly sounds like a verb. Du'a sounds like somebody's sitting there. Hmm. Yeah, so maybe it means just sit there like somebody, right? That's a told me a really neat word. It's uh -huh. Jigindatan. 
And she says, that. hmm? Jigin Datan. And she says it, what it means is that um, when somebody is just overwhelmed with tough feelings, it means to, she says it, what it means is to really, really have courage and to uh, not to give in to them. And she uh -huh. says um, a long time ago if people had terrible news, say they lost a family member, she says uh -huh. uh, she remembers when she was little this old, old lady telling this one other lady, Jagin Datan, and she said along with it, she said people used to say it must be an old way to put their sort of part of their hand and their thumb in their mouth and to bite hard and that would stop them from crying out and and uh, it must be something really old but that's what she says Jagin Jagin Datan means <laughs> does it make any sense? <laughs> Uh, I could so Jikin Datan. I'd have to. Um, I mean, the Jit is obviously in there. I'd have to spend some time with the rest, and Datan would certainly be there for the verb. Um, Tan. So when we get to clinket verbs, at the at the whole core is a root, and it's really usually located right towards the end. Oh, let me send. Quick invitation out. I realize there's somebody else. Um, oops. Let me send a couple invitations and then I will get back. Could it be like K, like some sort of contraction to K? Well, if you put your hand in your mouth. I don't think you. So the other thing about. Uh, Think it is um, there's it's almost like I like to think of it as a slot machine, right? So if you play a slot machine, especially a long time ago when they weren't digital, and this thing would roll its wheel and you get a cherry, and that means that's cherry. And then the next wheel and then the next wheel. So in Clink It there's a verb is kind of like that, where you can have j, or you can have to, or you can have ka, but you can't oh. combine them. So if the j is there, it's locked up. So the gi would, it's got to be a combination of, and it would depend if it's qi or gi. So you'd have to listen real close to see if it's qi or gi, because it's going to be probably either a conjugation prefix, which would make sense to be in a command form, like gidan. Um, or qa, which would be qa um, mode, or a conjugation prefix. It's hard to tell. And uh, in that case, um, it could be more like let it, let it be this way. So there's kind of two forms. There's command forms, and then there's uh, what we call hortative forms. So the command form would be like for me to say, get out, math guys. And then the hortative form would be like, let's go. It's still a command, but, and then another hortative form would be if you were somehow keeping the math guys who were sitting in my classroom from leaving, and I said, let them go. That's a hortative form as well. So they, it's a command form, but it's a little bit less direct. Who is talking? Why am I meeting? Uh, and there's a fire alarm. Oh my. This is an active day. Okay, let me see. There was a beware. Maybe turn it off the fire alarm. Love. Oh, sorry, in the White House. You on yet? That's a yeah. That actually might be us. There's a fire alarm going off in the background for us, so I think the microphone's picking up that we're trying to speak, but we're not. So the fire department just kind of showed up, so we're not quite sure what's going to happen yet. Just keep the planet. No, 
Shh, don't burn up. Don't burn up. <laughs> <laughs> so, so just uh, hope that everybody's safe. Let me try and invite one more student in. Okay. But I will definitely check it out, and I'll consult with uh, elders. I work with elders on usually Wednesdays and Fridays, and I'll ask them. They they get a kick out of old things that people don't say as much anymore. Jepping to con. And then the okay. Okay, there's somebody adding. Okay, we got one more. We're waiting for just one more. Let me try it again. Oh boy. I have to get a little early so I can get all the things set up. Okay. So one of the things that we get in Clinkit is we're gonna get this thing, like for example, um, and let me just I'm gonna say double click to edit, I'll get rid of that. So let me share this screen with you guys while we're talking about verbs and verbal structure. And then I'm going to share something else with you guys over here, too. And we're going to jump into some of the complexities of Clinkit verbs, because that's going to be our new neck of the woods, right? So this is a verb, uh, and, and there's a lot of things in Clinkit that uh, just get used less and less these days. And so these are the things that we're finding. It's very, very common, I think, with endangered languages that there's these little parts of speech and other things, and these phrases especially, when we get into phrases that have particularly... Uh, That's it, yeah? Uh, we're actually having to leave the building. I guess there's sprinklers or something going off somewhere in the fire department's here, so we're going to head out for a minute and see what happens. Okay, we'll be uh, praying for you guys. Go ahead. <laughs> You're welcome to come up to my place if you want. 40 Finch Crescent? Hey. Oh. Okay. <laughs> um, Colleen, we're, I guess we're on our way. We'll head up there. Okay. You okay? Push the ya, dasa ye wuti ye. Think it your tongue is to touch too. Doesn't matter what's happening, we'll keep learning. Clink it. So it's an interesting day. Uh, looks like a couple people getting. Kicked off, perhaps, having trouble signing on. Uh, we've got <laughs> calling me. <laughs> I, I'm going to get to this whole verb root discussion. So uh, one of the things that we have is identifying the different parts of a clinket verb. Um, I'm going to put an illustration up here, which will help us to uh, think about I might just do your own thing for a little while. Okay, let me stop that. Hold on. A gate in this gate, and yeah, got shenanigans. A gate in this gate, a gate in this gate. There's something going. Wrong. Okay. Huh. We do got a couple new pieces of gear which might help on our end. I'm not sure if the problem tonight is on our end or somebody else's end. Um, hopefully folks will be able to get in or at least view the class. Uh, I'll keep trying, but we also do have to keep moving forward a little bit. So we're going to look at a simple, an illustration that sort of shows uh, 
the basic verbal structure of clinket. So let me find that and then I'll <clears throat> then I'll start. Dasaya? Reed says he hasn't gotten an invite yet. I sent him like five times. I keep sending. It's like just crazy energy. Uh, Let me try emailing it. Okay. While we're waiting for folks to uh, migrate to different places and to sign on or sign back on or what have you, uh, we're going to talk about how a clinking verb works. This is sort of a, a blow up of it going from starting at the top being less detailed and as you go down we're getting more detailed. And talking about how a verb works. I wish I knew what that beep was. Be nice to know. So what you have is you have a verbal phrase. In the verbal phrase, you would have what I would call pre-verb material, verb material, post-verb material. There are other things that could be part of the sentence that help us to understand it. But the verbal phrase is saying, in order for that verb to function, it needs these certain components. Right? And so in Clinket, verbs function differently than what we might know in English. Uh, if you don't speak another Nadine language, odds are the verb works different than the language, other languages that you might know. So if we sort of blow in, in the pre-verb, mostly what you're going to get is stuff that refers to types of motion. So you're going to get types of motion, upwards, downwards, towards it, away from it, through it, that type of business. Uh, other things that you might get is yay in the terms of being thus, or you might get some uh, things we call it in the pre-contraction sort of pre prefix, it's still a prefix. Um, uh, so you're going to get some things that, that are going to pop up in here. Uh, and we'll talk about them as we sort of encounter them later, as we get further in the semester, revealing Clinket grammar. The post-verb, there's, you know, generally in Clinket, there's more stuff in the front than in the back. There's rarely stuff in the back. So the most common thing you'll see in a post-verb is going to be the word nooch, which means for something to always happen, right? Like he has technical difficulties with his class, <laughs> nooch, right? And so, but in Clinket, it comes immediately after the verb, right? So you'd, you'd say he has technical, he has nooch, technical difficulties with the class. And so, you've got to, oh, 
you sort of get your mind around some of these basic concepts and then embed. Again, because I know uh, uh, Reed just joined us, and I know our whole crew at Whitehorse <laughs> had to flee from a fire alarm <laughs> and go to another house. So we'll just, you know, we'll do this again next week. Uh, and we'll, we'll also look at specific examples. But if we look at the verb itself, and the verb is going to be one or two or three words, most commonly it's going to be one word. Um, <clears throat> the verb is made up of a prefix, a stem, and a suffix. Again, the, the suffix is very rare for things to be there. It's going to denote some type of repetition. In Klingit, it's, it's a perfect sort of OCD kind of language. Like, it's always keeping track of things. What type of thing is this? What type of thing is that? So you've got different types of repetition. You can have uh, something happens every time. You can have something happens in a, in a series. For example, he hit it in the head. And, you know, we could say, every time he gets a fish, he hits it in the head. Or you could say, when he pulls a fish up, he hits it a whole bunch of times in the head. Uh, and then you can have something in a series, like in a row, like sewing stitches, one, two, one right after another. So there's a type of repetition for something that's done in sort of some sort of sequence. The other types of suffixes you can get is for something to no longer happen. Um, and there might be, and there's a, one other for something to be in the process of happening. The prefix is where you're going to get most of, this is the most dynamic part of the clinket verb. This is where it starts to get really long in some cases. This is where you pack in your subject and object business, which is the, the fundamental key to conjugating clinket verbs. I see you, you see me, I see him, she sees me, right, and so on and so forth. So you can be dynamic with your verbs as far as who is doing what to whom. The other part is in there's thematic prefixes which sort of embed meaning. There are these little words that get put in there. They're built into the verb, like a mouth or a finger, you know, possession, or a hand. Um, uh, most commonly, other things, a nose or a point, um, a horizontal surface, a vertical surface. The object is, you know, and so there's, we were looking at this slideshow the other day in a linguistics class I'm in, and they said, you know, English is a language that goes subject, verb, object, right? He painted the fence. Right? And you can move it around, but the preferred way is subject, verb, object. With Clinkit, it's object, subject, verb. According to the slideshow, 0% of the world's languages are object, subject, verb. So it's like, we are the 0%. So you've got to remember the object comes first, all the other conjugation type of business, then the subject, then the classifier. Then the the other thing in the prefix is the classifier. We'll talk about that quite a bit this semester. And then you've got the root and what we call stem variation. The root contains the meaning. So this whole thing came about because I saw the root ton. <laughs> ton. There's a few of these roots where there's about four or five different versions of this one particular root. So they sound the same, but they are different, sort of like bow and bow. Bow and bow, right? And I said, Bow, talk about my cousin Bow, and we should know that. Uh, and then um, within the conjugation, you've got some business here, and there's, there's a lot of stuff to it, but what we'll do is we'll break it down as we go further in the semester, uh, and we'll build ourselves up to where we can talk about clinking grammar, and we can start to analyze things, because there's, I think there's multiple components to learning clinking. One is memorizing lists of stuff, and that's what we start practicing at the beginning clinking. Here's a bunch of names for things. Here's some phrases you can plug those names into. Here's some different ways you can express your emotions and have a basic conversation. In intermediate clinking, we'll keep doing stuff like that, 
but we'll start to get more dynamic and talk about different parts of speech and the language. And then we'll also be talking about how the verbs work. At the same time, your job outside of the classroom is to surround yourself with as much language as humanly possible. Look through other texts, listen and download and listen to audio, read stories, uh, read speeches, try to encounter other language speakers if you can, find a whole bunch of them, start calling them on the phone or bothering them, or go for coffee, have dinners, you know, do stuff together as a group. That means you know, if you want to become a speaker, you have to, you have to take that step. You are the one that has to surround yourself with it. You have to put yourself around other speakers. And that doesn't mean you, you abandon the non-speakers, but you do recognize who's in the boat, who's not in the boat, and everybody that's in the boat has to be more important to you. And it's a, it's a tough line to take. That doesn't mean that you're not friends with other people anymore, but it just means if you're serious about it and building the language community, and it's a fine line because you want to make sure that you're not making people feel left out. Uh, but you are recognizing when people are making decisions to not be there. Right? And it's, this is part of the revitalization conversation that we'll have throughout the whole semester as well. Any questions? Everybody okay? Broken cups. Weird microphone situations, fire alarms, math people in my classroom. <laughs> Ready. So I sent you guys a link to the uh, both the films, Language Matters, and also Rising Voices. Rising Voices is playing tonight. We're not ending class early, but feel free to go over at 7.30 if you would like to. Catch the remainder of the film, and there's a Skype discussion with the filmmakers. Uh, we'll also have a chance to talk about these films throughout the semester. I'll give you guys a chance to watch them as well. And there'll just be some concepts that are brought up, I think, in each of these films that are relevant to the types of things that we're doing, trying to do, planning to do. And uh, I think there's one or two more films. One more. There's one more film. Did you send the link out to us, too? Yeah. What? Did everybody else get it? I got it. Guess you do this. Do you use your UAS email? Do you use, I got like some Gmail thing or Hotmail? Yeah, I use my UAS. I hop back and forth with my Gmail stuff. I check it out. just cancel it after I do all <laughs> stuff online. <laughs> oh, sorry. What did I have to adjust? <laughs> Thank you, Joe Smith. <laughs> okay. Aww. Well, just say it and then you remember. Yeah. So, yeah. Where we could be fully encrypted. It's fully encrypted. Unless, like, there's some clink at working for the government. Wow. They're in trouble. What are you talking about? Okay, everybody online. <laughs> everybody okay. We just had the most amazing grammar chat of all time. Sorry. You guys missed it. We will do it again. Glad everybody's safe. Uh, oops. Okay. So moving right along. Uh, I'm going to share the screen. We're going to do now and then. We're going to have grammatical moments. They're wonderful, uh, and that's what we're going to have briefly today. We're going to talk about parts of speech and clinkets because it's important to understand generally how the language functions. What's a part of speech? Like a pronoun? Or a pronoun is a part of speech? Particle. Yeah. Or like is and am. Uh, well, it's not so much like breaking down, like here's a word here, here's a word there. But it's just sort of classifying the types of words that exist in the language. Right. Words, nouns. So there's nouns, and within nouns verbs. there are pronouns. There's verbs and adjectives, adverbs. There's interjections, right? Like, whoa! What does that mean, right? And so, and, they, and you get a lot of them, right? And so interjections are something we're going to look at 
and very, you know, we're sitting there translating. I do a lot of translation work. We're translating work, and the speaker he'll say, eh. I'll say, ha ha, and I just turn to Nels. I'm like, what does that mean? But I mean, it depends on the context. Eh. That means, like, say you're walking along and you see something awesome. Eh. You just say that. Everybody say, eh, 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 eh. eh. But if it's disgusting, you can say, ee, ee. How? If that's something you could say that's sort of just saying, well, right? And then there's, huh, 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 Something happens, and a little bit surprises you, right? And interjections and clinket are fun, because almost all of them can be used for teasing or to signal some sort of disappointment in somebody, which is always fun. OK, so parts of speech, we're classifying words as far as how they function and what they do. So we're going to go through some parts of speech and clink it. This is a, a, just a quick overview. We're going to come back to each of these parts in detail. But as we shift from beginning clink it to intermediate, and we did, we're doing a real quick walkthrough of the beginning clink it stuff just for just to get warmed up to the idea of sort of getting back into the rhythm of learning Clinkit. Uh, again, when we go on winter break, find a way to keep in the language. When we go on summer break, find a way to keep in the language. Okay. All right. Uh, so as we go into intermediate Clinkit, one of the things that we will do is dive into each of these things. Um, when we talk about parts of speech, we're not going to get to all of them. There's going to be, we're going to just do. Uh, the first sort of sets that we're going to focus on this semester. So the first thing is nouns. And, and if this is uh, maybe small on your screen or something, uh, I will post uh, copies of this on uh, clinkitlanguage.com under our intermediate Clinkit <coughs> site. And there's a draft of the new dictionary I've been working on that's coming up, I'll have more detailed sort of versions of this stuff. So the first thing that we focus on in Clinkit are nouns, right? And so when you're learning a language, uh, one of the really common things, and if you're teaching a language, at some point you got to get out of the nouns, right? And so some of the things that we see as we look at people teaching languages is we, we just say, be careful that you're not always teaching numbers, colors, and animals, right? And we kind of joke about it, and we kind of tease about it, but it's also it's hard to move beyond that, right? What is this? What is that? What is this? What is that? And so, but nouns are it's a good starting point, right? Because you can look at a picture, you could see something outside, and you can you know we went to the to the top of the, the tram thing last night, and, and there's all these pictures of animals. I could just talk to my kids about what those animals are and their footprints and stuff like that. Uh, but I can also say, Somebody translate that? Uh, yesterday morning. Uh, yesterday morning, a bear got in my trash. Yesterday morning, a bear ate my trash. And he threw it all over the place. Um, not you shown me, you shown my tenant who cleaned it up. <laughs> so, cheesh to him. Uh, OK. So, what types of nouns do we have in clinking? We have common nouns, right? It's just a noun. Uh, it's a very short word, typically, one or two syllables. Ock, eek. Yake. These are very old words for us. One of the things that happens is if, so if we possess something and we're marking possession in English, for example, here is a book. This belongs to Susie. How would I say that in English? <laughs> Susie's book. Susie's book, right? So Susie gets the apostrophe S business, and that means Susie possesses it. 
that means the possessor gains a suffix. In clinket, the noun that is being possessed gains a suffix. So you'd say Susie Bookie. Right? If we were speaking clink we were speaking English, using clinket grammatical rules, that's how we take care of it. Okay? So this is what a common noun is. Is when it's possessed, it gets a it gets a suffix. There's an awesome set of rules. I think there's about three combining rules that come into what kind of suffix it is. In general, make it an I. Okay? And we'll go from there. The I is the default, and we'll go from there. It could be any, it'll be one of these things. An I, a U, a YI, or a W. <coughs> A compound noun is a noun that's made up of several nouns. You know, they're typically nouns that get smashed together. Uh, and we'll, we'll look at things like this as well. They could have verbs stuffed in there as well. Um, and we'll take a look at some and, and how they break down. But they function the same as nouns. They just tend to be longer. You also have verbal nouns where it's a verb that's turned into a noun, like ashuni. Right? Achun is hunt, achuni. So a lot of times a verb gets turned into a noun just by putting a relational suffix on there. And the racial, relational suffix behaves exactly like the possessive suffix. Or you'll put these two A's on the end, like khut'a and hit'a and kuhita. You also have borrowed nouns which are nouns that come from other languages, like douche and wasus. Uh, these are commonly things that are fairly new to uh, Clinket country and Clinket people. And so they typically they, they can't be broken down very easily, but then you could tell. They, they usually come from a neighboring language, or they come from Chinook jargon, or they come from a European language. Any questions? So then we get into proper nouns, and proper nouns cannot be possessed, right? So you cannot say achune or ha akhuan, right? You, you, it's there's just problems with it conceptually, and there's problems with it grammatically. So proper nouns are place names, region names, clan names, and people's names, right? You don't possess. So they're also and when we say personal name, this involves certain big spiritual creatures and other things like that from our stories. Uh, you know, so a place name is typically a compound noun. There's a lot of different land parts in there. Um, sometimes it has some really like incredible meanings. Uh, sometimes it's just very straightforward, like Sakai River, which is you know, there's a Sakai River. Everywhere that there's been think of people living, I think. Uh, and then there's a region name, and region is something, Quan, which is the people of whatever. And it's usually some place name as well, like Aku, Aku, So usually there is a place called that. And then you've got Quan, which means the people of that particular place. Clan names also commonly contain place names, or they'll, they'll contain the name of a house. So there's it, there is a house next to another house, and then tan. So so when you've got the, the tan ending, that means it's the people of some house. Uh, when you've got the adi or ad ending, that means the things of some particular place. Uh, and then you've got Quan, which would be the people of, I think it's most of them. There's Ai as well, which would be the ones belonging to some particular place. And then you have personal names. And as you learn Clinket, people are undoubtedly going to ask you what their names mean. And I think 75% 75 of the time, you can say, I don't know. Because personal names are hard, because they're really old. Sometimes they're made for some particular event. You know, so it means only this in that particular thing. 
maybe didn't have a particular meaning, um, or it could be extremely contracted. Right. So w there's rules of contraction in thinking. There's when we make compound nouns, uh, typically what happens is the vowels go short and low, except for the word at the very end. Are you okay? Somebody asked me the other day how to like. He doesn't have a Plinket name or anything like that. He has an English name. He's like, so how do I translate this to Plinket? I'm like, well, you don't. And I kind of explained it the way how you like start your beginning classes, or if you don't have a Plinket name for this class, just to like pick something, and then like if you get really serious about it, maybe you'll be adopted into a clan, and maybe you'll be given a name, or you'll keep that name. Mm -hmm. And I gave like Eda as an example, like how. That progressed, but I was like, I think that's it, unless. Yeah, so you can, there's a number of different things that can happen with that. Um, <clears throat> I'll turn this off for a second, then we'll go back. So we can see faces. Uh, so when it comes to names, uh, it's, a, it's a sensitive subject, you know, because there's a lot of people who were born. And who are Clinket, and they don't get a Clinket name for whatever reason. Uh, and so that's the type of thing we need to be focusing on. I think other things are people uh, who get adopted and they receive names. And then there's people who come to the language, and it, it's a big deal. It's a big deal for us. And every clan and every individual is going to think of these things differently. I think uh, for. For example, you know, and people have asked me legitimately, and you know, try not to always. You know, I tell my kids, I said, don't laugh at people. You can laugh with them, but try not to laugh at them too much. And I told her, you know, I told her a story of Naki Dap, and I was like, this story is kind of scary. She's four years old, and you know, and like this little bird comes around and plucks everybody's eyes out because people were laughing at it, and they're all laying there with like, I didn't get into the Full detail, with laying still, with pools of blood in their eye. But it toasts their eyes and it eats them because they were laughing at that bird. And so, and then we get to the end of the story, and then she said, "What was the scary part?" You know, I'm like, it plucked their eyes out and cooked them and ate them. That's terrifying. She's like, whatever. Um, so, but some people they, they'll come and say, "How do you say John in Clinket?" And I'll say. What does John mean? And so there might be cases where somebody has a name, and that name does have, you know, most names have meaning. They come from somewhere. So I guess you could find out what that name means and come up with an equivalent. Or typically, we let people choose nicknames that they use. And so my understanding is when children were born, their fathers would give them a nickname. I've done that with all three of my kids, uh, except for the middle one, who had a name when she was born. Uh, and then later, maybe they get a more official type of name. Yeah. And it depends. Maybe that name sticks. Maybe the clan steps in because the father's not the same clan and says, OK, we're going to give him this name. Or sometimes a child is born, and they, they just say, that's who that person is. So it, it varies. But I, I think a long time ago, it wasn't that hard for us to name people. Nowadays, you know, they say, well, you got to wait till there's a potlatch, and then you got to do this. And, you know, I don't think that's how it's always been. I think maybe you could give out big names, right? So if you might have a name, and then if you built a new clan house, they would give you another name. If you do something for your people, you know, so you might end up with four or five names your whole life. Uh, you might end up, you know, and so and some of those are really big names as well. Uh, yeah. Or brand new names. Or they can be brand new. Like, <laughs> we should never stop making names. We should also never stop exploring the richness of all of our names. I think one of, another thing, I need a lot of my opinion. Another thing that happens is as you get fewer and fewer Plinket speakers, people will remember fewer names. And so they see people who get kind of famous, and they say, oh, well, I want to make sure my kid has that name. And then people get these sort of disagreements about who should get which name. And meanwhile, there's a hundred other names that are just sort of falling off the table. And there's such amazing names that are out there. And these names, 
And when you get a name, it ties you to the kinship system of that person. We'll talk about kinship and how it functions. Um, okay, I'm ready to get back to my parts of speech. Quick question. question about Tengit yeah. um, Ani. Um, I have here the, the pinch T um, describing the world. Yeah. Shingitani is the world. Shingitani is a clinket land. And it depends on the context. Like I could say, that's clinket land. Or I could be referring to this whole area that belongs. Does that apply anywhere else, or is that just the. What's that? Does that apply anywhere else with pinch T? No, I think that's the only okay. example I know. <laughs> All right. So yeah, Shingitani is the world. Are you okay? We'll take a break as soon as we're done with our slides. Okay. So now we get into pronouns. Clinkett has 64 pronouns. Um, uh, and some of them, they sound the same, but it's a different type of pronoun. It takes a long time, I think, to learn how to use these correctly. Uh, same thing with English, right? When do you use whom? You have to answer that. Um, but then, so a pronoun, when we use these pronouns, this is a really fundamental part of using the Clinkit language, right? So you could say this, you know, a big part is verbs, and then a big part is pronouns. Because pronouns are saying who's doing what, who did it happen to, you know, and, and beyond that, it's conjugating verbs so that they can be dynamic. You can use them to talk about things that happened, things that might happen, if this happens, and, and so on and so forth. So those are the types of pronouns that we get to. And, and we've dealt with these things in threes, right? So basically, you've got who's doing it and how many people might be doing this sort of thing. Every language, they handle the pronouns differently. Uh, so they're, if things are different, don't be shocked. So an independent pronoun is not tied to anything grammatically. These are the, the pronouns. These are the only pronouns that have a tone mark. And they all have a tone mark, right? So chet, high toned, I mean me, right? So the, the example when you might use one of these pronouns is if I was knocking on the door, kuh, kuh, kuh. Someone says, I do so well. Who is that? Chetaya, right? It's me. And I can say my name, Chataya Chone. Or I can just say Chataya, and you better know who I am. Or there's this other thing we talked about this Gusu and Yadu, Weidu business. Those are verbless phrases, right? So you could say Gusu Chone. I'll say Yadu Chat. That is a high tone pronoun, independent, right? The other area is sometimes they're used to clarify. That is the one. Him. He knows or she knows. There's the possessive pronoun, and these are ones that we've probably heard. Ha, ach, it, ye. Right? So this means to show possession or a relationship. Right? And so in Clinket, like in English, you'd say next to me. In Klingit, you'd say ach chani, my next to, right? So it uses a possessive pronoun, right? Instead of English, probably uses an object pronoun. But I thought about it real hard and went wrong. And then also in the conjugation of certain verbs, where it's not using a true object pronoun, but what we call an indirect object. Like so, you say. My spirit is happy. And there's certain emotions that get conjugated that way. And there's certain um, other verbs that get, that get conjugated. Now we've got object pronouns. Object pronouns are kind of who the verb happens to, uh, but in the state of a lot of emotion verbs, like you could say, uh, me sick, right? That's how you would translate that, not I am sick. And so we just keep an eye on what type of pronoun it takes for there so that we know how to conjugate. 
right? Because you wouldn't want to say Chayanik, because that it would just it just doesn't quite work. Uh, so object pronouns, and there's there's quite a few. There's rules as far as when is the object pronoun part of the verb? When is it written separate from the verb? There's the rule. If the object pronoun is one letter, it is written as part of the verb. If it is more than one letter, So those are the exceptions. And we'll, we'll look at some charts and examples. Don't have to worry about it now. But this is the thing that appears usually right at the very front of the verb. There's a subject pronoun. This is the one who is doing the verb. Uh, so we'll, we'll look at examples as well. So you'll say khatin, I see, igatin, you see, ayatin, he or she sees. And so we'll look at how these change. The other thing with these pronouns is there's a few categories that Clinkit has that English does not. And the first one we'll look at is what we call the fourth person. Right? So when it's a fourth person object, we could say it happens to people. Right? Kusacha. He or she eats people. Right? Uh, and. Kusachan, right? Better. She <laughs> loves people. Why not? Maybe they love to eat. <laughs> okay, so yeah, okay, love. Kusachan, right? Why do you say that? Oh, he, he or she loves to eat people? That's bad. Kusacha asachan. Kusacha asachan. Okay. Uh, and then in the subject, so this is like it happens to people. You know, and then in the subject is it happens. That's the best way to, or somebody does it, right? So, for example, uh, if you were if we were walking, we saw a plant, and I said dasaya, and you said tsch tsch, get? Do people eat that? Is it edible? Plague, plague, kupanama. No, it kills people. Right? Uh, and then the last in this category is postpositional pronouns. These are a combination of a possessive pronoun and what we call the empty base. So ach e, e e, du e, ye e. These come about with certain types of motion verbs and a few other verbs. Like I'll say. I'm telling you all about our language. And again, we'll look at examples. I just want to give you guys an idea of these different parts of speech. A few more nouns. We've got relational nouns and suffixes. That means these have to be tied to something. Right. And there's a concept in Clinkit called alienability, which means like it, it can't be separate. And the first one is kinship terms. Right? So if it's uh, there there is an exception, right? Like the difference between uh, mom in English is in my mom and mom, right? That's you're talking directly to your mom. Right? And so in Clinkit, if you're talking directly to that person, you don't really need a pronoun. Ish. Right? You're talking directly to them. But if you're talking about the person, they need to have a pronoun. Ach ish, du ish, it ish. So because of that, in a lot of the newer materials that are coming out, you'll see this longer dash in front of it. And that means you have to put something there. It needs a word that it belongs to. Right. And in the case of kinship, it needs to be a pronoun. Uh, it, it, could be a, a, it could be somebody's name, though. You could say, um, no way at all to say that. Okay. And then a body part as well. A body part should have a possessive pronoun with it or a noun. Right? And so, 
And so the difference you know, with kinship terms and body parts, uh, they don't get possessive pronouns. Body parts get possessive pronouns if they have been permanently removed. Uh, Jinny, right? The rabbit's foot, people wear them sometimes. <laughs> Put them on their key rings or something. Um, or if we walked into the classroom and there was a hand here, do Jinny, right? That would belong to somebody, but it would get the possessive pronoun, which means it's been removed. Hopefully, we don't have to use. Yeah, we'll cut that. So then, the other parts of speech that we have, and this is the last one, and we'll look at some pronoun examples and take a break. Then we'll come back in. We'll just go back to nouns and our story. You have plant parts and land parts. I, I, I kind of like to point these out because you'll see, you know, these are a KD. Like you, you don't see it outside of belonging to some type of um, thing. They might say a KD, but it's a seed. Um, and then kayani can work as a plant or a leaf or some kind of greenage that grows on something. Um, a land part uh, is a point. Um, and these help because as you encounter place names and other things, you, you sort of know what type of word that is. And then as far as there's these three other relational things which are very closely related but they function a little differently. One is called an independent base. These start talking about where something is in relation to a fixed point in the Clinkett universe. Usually this is where the ocean meets the land, right? So we can go from the inland to the ocean, from the ocean to the inland, from the shore out to sea, from the sea to the shore, up above, down below, in a house, out of a house. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. And so we can we'll write a book with them, with all of them. But they can they call them, we call them independent because they don't need another word to belong to. So you could say the key, and you could say naif, and you could say dock, and you could say dock. And then you know you can go on from there, but it doesn't need another word to belong to. A relational base is its own word, but it needs to belong to another word because it talks about the relationship between two things. Between these things, on top of this thing, below this thing, um, sort of like in English, right? Like you would, you wouldn't really say "on" unless you sort of specify what it's on, right? Like someone says, "Where's my keys?" On, <laughs> right? And you can say like, uh, "Turn the light on." I don't know. But and so clink is the same way. So they have to, and we learn the dynamics of the words "up," because "up" is just it. A cut, it's on it, right? A tie, it's below it. A da, it's around it. So relational bases and independent bases, they can take on a suffix. A suffix is like day, towards, nach, through, dach, from. Relational nouns, they, they need to belong to something, but they cannot take on a suffix. And we'll see some examples of those as well. That's probably enough for lecture. These are some pronouns, but I think we've probably done enough of this type of stuff for now. We'll come back to these in a second, and we'll talk about the fourth person. Uh, there's two types of fourth person. There's a fourth person human and a fourth person non-human. Right. And they're very powerful, very, very powerful and clinky. OK, any questions? Take five. Five minute break. Did, did the White Forest people ever sign on again? Yeah, they're here. Oh, okay, they, they joined with. Um,
I think you're muted on that end, but I'd love to know who's Bentwood Box that is. We kind of need to get that big softy. Alicia, she's coming in. Reed, how do you say <laughs> your your new PF name again? around the classroom. We'll see how that works, especially when we get to our online gang. Uh, everybody, everybody just repeat after me. Dasaway Iyatin. Dasaway Iyatin. Dasaway Iyatin. Dasaway Iyatin. Okay. Zait. 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 Saw. 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 Speak. 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 Quasta, 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 Okay, so now we get to these pronouns. We're going to start in groups of three. Uh, maybe next week we'll work in the fourth person. Uh, so starting with these independent pronouns. Point at yourself, one finger at yourself. In the classroom, it's okay if we do this. Sometimes it's kind of rude. Now you're going to point at somebody that you're talking to. This is the person that you were talking to. Now you're going to talk to that same person, point at somebody else, and say, Okay? This is how this works. It is for weird foot in somebody. It is kind of, yeah, right? Like, like I'm you! Chewing you out or accusing you of something, right? It was you. You, you. <laughs> Okay. First person. 
It's myself. Or it's the speaker, right? The first person is the self. The second person is the person you're talking to. The third person is the person you're talking about because you're saying, he's awesome. But you don't say, I'm awesome because you get in trouble. You're awesome. He's awesome. I'm me, right? That's, <laughs> that's what you do in your clinkets. You're careful that you're not bragging about yourself because that's when the bad stuff begins to happen. Okay. So the way that I would like to do this is everybody will say in Syria, I'll say it, and then we'll send it around the room. Everybody will have a chance to say it. Uh, when we get to online folks, I've got, uh, I've got, uh, we'll just do this geographically. Uh, got Washington and California. Then Whitehorse, and presumably Sitka, although Alda Gan's a world traveler. And then the mountains. I don't know where Reed is. Uh, and then we come back to this side. Okay. So this you're going to do three in a row. And it, I think it helps to use visual things, point at yourself. You don't have to look at somebody. You can have an imaginary person you're talking to. Keep talking to that imaginary person, and then point at somebody else. So the way it works, I'll do it first, and then zoom it, and then we'll send it around. There are there are four people on the left. Then we go online, one, two, three, four, five different groups. And then we come back, and there's three on my right. So this isn't everybody. Just listen. Khat wa eh hu. Khat wa eh hu. Khat wa eh Cut what a hook. Cut what a hook. Cut what a hook. Cut what a One Lin. What eh? Who? Hut where? Hut where? Who? Hut where? Who? Hut where? Who? Hey, how the gun? Hat wa e hu. Okay. Haluk. Hat wa e hu. Okay. I think it's. Can you say, say your name for me? Patluk. 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 Okay, there we go. I knew I had it wrong. Hmm. And. Uchkad she it koaha. He screen sai away stogi book. Okay. So now we'll shift to the so this is saying it's me, it's you, it's him or her. The third person pronoun is well all these pronouns are genderless, so they work for they're perfect. They don't get you into trouble, uh, you know, and they could refer to, and when you're conjugating, you don't have to look and think about somebody's gender. You, just, you can just conjugate. Uh, when we get to possessive, now we're, instead of saying me, you, him, or her, we're saying my, your, her, or his. Okay? So now, uh, Grab something, just whatever it is, doesn't matter. Kuhida ayachibu. So this is yours. I'm gonna go into full toddler mode. Ach. 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 Now it belongs to this person that you're talking to. Eh. Eh. 
E, 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 e. Now it's hers or it's his. Do, 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 do. So let's use. Hey, there's a word. What's on do a sock house? Hit H high toned I T. Everybody say hit. 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 What happens if I put ach in front of it? Ach hitty. Ach hitty. Ach hitty. Ach hitty. Ach hitty. Ach hitty. So I need you guys a mission over the weekend. I want you to find a kind of small, like about the size of a piece of paper, a uh, little dry erase board type of thing mm -hmm. with a marker. You should be able to get it at Admire, Office Max, or wherever you shop in your neighborhoods out there. There should be one you can find. Um, don't spend a whole bunch of money trying to get something that's cheap. But we're going to practice writing so that, you know, and then we can show each other what we've written. Uh, but so this is going to be, so if we write hit, somebody spell hit for me. Yeah, so H, high toned I, T. Okay, so let's just say high tone and then the vowel and then T. We'll say underline and then the consonant. So somebody spell ach. A underline X. Okay. We're going to get out of mumbly mode. Somebody spell hitty. H high tone I D I. H high tone I D I. Okay. There's a couple of different things going on here. One is we're adding possessive suffix. Two is it's changing the T to a D. Three is it's it's a low-toned I at the end. Okay, and when you get into these rules, because rules are awesome, but for now, achiti, 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 do hitti, do hitti. Do hitty. Do hitty. Do hitty. And then the i could be i or e. It's a e hitty. Doesn't matter. So I'm gonna say it, and then we'll send this around our little universe again. Ah hitty, i hitty, do hitty. Ah hitty, i hitty, do hitty. Ah hitty, i hitty. So ach in do. And it helps to sort of stare strangely and creepily at somebody while you're doing it because it's like and then it does help to sort of embed these things. Um, and that way when you use them later, you think, oh yeah, I was staring creepily at this person while doing it. But it helps to just sort of keep it. Ach hitty, eh hitty, do hitty. Okay. Who? Ach hitty, eh hitty, do hitty. Okay. Ach hitty, eh hitty. Hit or if hitty, do hitty. Ach hitty, if hitty, do hitty. Ach hitty, do hitty. I forget the last one. Do hitty. Ach hitty, e hitty, do hitty. Ach hitty, e hitty, do hitty. Okay. 
Hashtag Autogang. Ach, Hitti. Du Hitti. E Hitti. Du Hitti. Ach, E Hitti. Du Hitti. Ja, okay. Hasuk. Ach, Hitti. E Hitti. Du Hitti. Cheese. Uchkunch. I'll try one more time. Okay. Cheesh. Any questions? So if he is now talking about your house. Yeah, your house. We're going to your house. And they hit do is like I'm talking to you, but we're talking about Jasmine. Yeah, so what you can't do is go ah hit the eh hit the do hit the right? So you've got and we that's why we practice yeah. the eye contact thing. Okay. So it's like talking about me, talking about you, talking about her. But it's all positive, it's all good. It's not gossip. So just control, make sure you're not doing because sometimes once we go ach, we'll we'll go to everything. Right? And so we just gotta keep in mind. I don't know what that would be. Achiti. Okay, never mind. Okay. Any other questions? Achtana ye idana ye. Stakat at achtana. It's always my mind. Okay, hold on. Before I get too out of control. Okay, so now we've got subject and object, and we're going to do both of these. Uh, we're going to introduce two verbs here, and the first one um, is, well, I'll teach you the third person version of it first. Ayatin. 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 Everybody should have some sort of paper in front of you, perhaps. And I would like you to spell that. Not out loud. Spell it right now how you think it should be. Ayatin. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Somebody in the internet land where Kashukre Wukwan. Somebody out there spell for me. Ayatin. I Y A T high toned E E N. Kushe. Okay. That is a very good guess. It is A. Y A T high toned E E N. So yes. Ayatin Ayatin. So now because it's a verb, I'm gonna break down a little bit for you. So if we were to just sort of break this thing apart, A hyphen zero marker and the zero marker Looks like this dude right here. See him right there? It's not quite, there's like a Norwegian letter that's kind of similar, but it's not that one. I was thinking of like a crooked, uh, slanted philosophy side. Oh, oh. Needs a VA. Okay, so A hyphen zero marker hyphen YA hyphen T E E N hyphen. Teen is the verb root. It means to see. Ya is the classifier. Don't worry about what it is right now. The snow. Hey, that's a classifier. What is that zero marker? 
the object or the subject? Like, subject that is the subject. Okay. That is, so that would be S slash H E, or however you like to write that, he or she, right? Because that's the subject. What is the A? Object. That is the object. So that is her slash him slash it. That's what you've got. Ayatim, he or she sees her, him, or it. Okay? And we'll do the next one. We'll go to the first person. Khatin. 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 Write it down. Khatin. Simon, I will talk. <laughs> Would somebody like to spell that for me? Load. Oh, go ahead. After you. Okay. Underline X A A T high tone E E N. Yach away. A yach away. Underline X. A A T high tone E E M. So, if we were to break this apart as to what the different components are, it would be zero marker hyphen ch underline X A hyphen ya Y A hyphen, teen, T high tone E, E N. What is the teen part? To see. What is the ya part? Classifier. Classifier. What is the ch part? Subject. Yes. Me. I. The subject is I, right? Because you don't say me cut it. I cut it. I wrote. <laughs> and what is the zero? He, she, or it. Everybody okay? Any questions? You're not okay? <laughs> We're moving on. <laughs> Unless, but you can ask a question. And you can tell me you're not okay. If you're like seriously not okay, let me know. Otherwise, we'll just keep going. Okay. The last one is going to be the second person. Iyatin. 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 Kaishat it. Gook. Write it down. Iyatin. Iyatin. Would somebody like to spell it? Don't be shy. If you haven't done it yet, go ahead. I Y A T high tone E E N. A yach away. I Y A T high tone E E N. If we were to break this apart, how would it go? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is it zero? Zero marker. Hyphen. 
I hyphen ya y a hyphen teen the high tone e. What is the teen? The z the verb. What is the ya? What is the e? You. You yes is the subject pronoun for you. What is the zero? She, he, or it? Yep. It should actually be her, him, or it. Her, him, or it. Or it, her, him, whatever combination you want to go with. But, you know, so you say, I'm talking to, you don't say I'm talking to he. <laughs> say I'm talking to her. So we just, you know, we're, we're just keeping this in mind, how they work, because they're in a different word order in clink. So... We have one that's a zero, and we see object, subject, classifier, root. This is how they work. It's how they work. How come it goes zero, zero, but the first one we did starts with the letter A? What's up with that? Because you can't have two zeros. You cannot have two zeros, or else you would not know that there's something there. So if the third person, if the subject and the object are both third person, object will be A. Otherwise, it's always zero. Okay? So we get into some sort of, some rule business. I had a little, like, meme thing. It says, who's down with three on three, something like that. You know me. Uh, and then there was a little zero to the A. Third person, third person. Okay. So now we're going to do our verbs. So we think of our little triangle. On the top of our triangle is khatin. Okay, so everybody. Khatin. Khatin. Then the next step over will go to the left hand side. Iyatin. Iyatin. Ayatin. Ayatin. Okay, so now we're going to see some houses. Okay. Hitchatin. 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 Hit e a teen, 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 hit 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 a teen. Okay, we're sending this one around. We're not going to say them, the three of them. And we'll send it around starting through the Hit ha teen, hit e a teen, hit a teen, hit ha teen, hit e a teen, hit a teen, hit ha teen, hit e a teen, hit a teen. Hit a teen. Hit a 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 teen. Hit a Hit a Hit 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 Ayatin. Hey. He was talking to us. Two sitting cool, eat for her. Hit Ayatin. Hit Ayatin. Hit Ayatin. Okay, so we get the ha in the very front. 
Okay. Okay. Ron Lynn. Hip ha teen. Hip I a teen. Hip a a teen. Hip ha teen. Hit I a teen. Hit I a teen. Hit ha team, hit ear team, hit ear team, hit ha team, hit ear team, hit ha team, hit ha team, hit ear team, hit ear team, hit ha team, hit ear team, hit ear team, hit ha team. Hit ear team, hit eye team. How did I? Hit ach, hit hatin, hit ear teen, hit ear teen. Okay, eye teen is the last one. Hashuk. Hit hatin. Hit ear teen, hit eye teen. Quick to eat. Hit ach ha ha teen, hit ear teen, hit eye teen. Hit ha teen, hit ear teen, hit eye teen. Hit ha team, hit ear team, hit eye team. Hey, that's Chi Xi Jin Tuck and I touch. So, as far as the, the prefixes that are going on there, so if I were to just lock the, uh, the root off of there, it would go ha, iya, aya. Ha, iya. Aya. So we get that, you know, ha, iya, aya. And if we took the classifier off, we've got ha, i, a. Right? And so there's the a business because it's the third person object and subject. You okay, guy? Okay. Did you try to explain this to us last year? Okay. Everybody say do a sock, 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 do a Well, you know what? We're going to do a different verb. Okay. Everybody say. Yeah. Uh, anybody anybody want to spell it for us? <laughs> Does anybody have to spell it? It's got to be somebody else. Okay. D U W A S I T O N A A K W. Yakecha, a yakewe. Everybody say, yuck a, 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 Anybody online, perhaps? Anybody in the room, maybe? Y A Y A K pinched E I. 
Uh, y, A, K, pinched, K apostrophe, a K pinched is a good way to say it. High tone E, I. Yuck, A. Yuck, A. Yuck, A. Yuck, A. Yuck, A. Okay. So now we're going to change the object pronouns. Okay, so we're going to see them. Um, let me pull them up on the screen. Look at this quickly. So here we are, right here. So using yep a as our verb, first person. Chat <laughs> yep a. Chat <laughs> yep a. Chat <laughs> yep a. <laughs> I'm looking at somebody, giving them a nice, nice compliment. And we're talking about somebody who's awesome. Yuck A. Yuck A. Yuck A. <laughs> okay, so we're going to send this one around, then we're going to be out of time. We didn't get to our story, but that's just fine. Pretty sure. Cut your cake. If your cake. Your cake. Cut your cake. If your cake. Your cake. Cut your cake. E. Your cake. Your cake. Okay. 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 You gotta tell her. You gotta look at her. Go tell me about it. You can't point at her. Yeah. 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 Yeah, what? Two shits in cool. Yake. E. Yake. Yake. And cheese. Quan Ling. Hat yake. E. Yake. Yake. Hat yake. E. Yake. Yake. Hat yak a, 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 Okay. Hat yak a. E yak a. Yak a. Ye yak a, ha yak a, ye a what? So the next step we're going to take is we're going to move to the plural pronouns. Uh, I'll probably use a different verb for seeing. And even the thing it's like you see, he or she see. It's kind of weird to see, I guess. It's been like tasa khatin. What do I see? I guess if there was some mystical, magical thing happening, and I had to confirm it. Uh, maybe I could ask, or if, I don't know. Anyways, uh, so we'll probably use a different verb. Uh, maybe love, that's always a good verb. Uh, and then we'll just sort of do this, and we'll move into what do you have, what do I have, we'll go back to our story. Every now and then we're going to step over, we're going to do some big grammatical thing, and then we'll do some drills. Uh, but it's the fundamentals that we're trying to get. Uh, but I'll probably read. We'll probably read a big chunk of this story next week as well. As always, let me know if you guys have questions, um, especially if you 
think over the weekend. And the only way to guarantee success is to make sure that there's language in your life once we leave this room. And as much as you can possibly muster, the more you can do that, the faster you'll be on a path to fluence. Uh, and I think the big challenge I see for students is language production. There has to be language production. You have to be putting this together in your mind and making your mouth do this in ways that push you beyond what you're comfortable with to the point where you're trying things out, where you're not afraid of looking a little bit silly at times, uh, but that way we can get uh, the exercise that you need. Because I think what happens is we produce a lot of students who I could talk to them and they can translate what I'm saying, but we, we have a harder time engaging in a conversation. So find ways to do that, hang out with each other, doing additional things. If, if you don't have speakers around you, um, you can call me during office hours, or we can figure out, we can share contact information. I sent out multiple emails. We have everybody's email address now. Uh, the language community has to become the community that ensures its own survival. It has to be a different mode of operation than other we have to become like a commune. We have to become crazy <laughs> commune. Nobody's going to do it but us type of thing because the rest of the world will pollute us with their filthy English. And we need to make sure that we are a top. We are pure with our thinget. When she trains to cut you on, yet a whack which up. Any questions? Very good. When I was outside of class and someone asked me my favorite name, but I wanted to specify that it was just a student name and not an actual name, would you just put an Esquaini in there somewhere? Yeah, I get an Esquaini sign. Good cheese.